very much. Wow. I just want to pause for a moment. I sense there's such a tremendous anointing in this place this morning. And God wants to do something special. Amen. I'm always expectant that when we come together, because the Word of God declares, when two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord, He is there. And where God is, there is always blessing, release, healing, and whatever the house needs, whatever the individual needs. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all that you have been doing over the past few days, starting with the leadership council and even yesterday at the funeral and that overflow coming into today's meeting. We thank you, God, that we never underestimate your ability to do things beyond our reason power. You are limitless, God. Yet God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can ask or even think of. Yet a God who is able to do that which we have never even imagined. So come and bless us now, Lord. Release the anointing of your power and the fire of your presence. We bless you for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I didn't get a chance to extend greetings, Pastor Nolin. Um, my babes, my, the most beautiful woman in the whole wide world. And you should say amen. amen. <laughs> and the leadership of God's Family Life Church extend their greetings to you. We're looking forward to your coming to Culture Shapers, 26, 27, 28, 29th of March. That's two months away. And uh, if you want to come, you talk to Pastor Len. We're always open to have people coming. And we know the women are coming here to Priceless in in April, and I've got, I'm lining up some leaders to come to Stronger this year. So we are, we're expecting great things, amen. So, when you at the pulpit, one has to constantly remember, this is God's business, and we're building God's people, therefore it's serious business. God loves people. The Bible says, he came to seek and save the lost. As churches, we can get caught up in the politics, in the joy of worship, in the blessing of God doing things among us, and we can forget there's a dying world, there are people out there who need the love of Jesus. To be called upon in this season, in this moment, is a privilege to be alive in the earth. I really believe and I sense the Holy Spirit leading me this morning to speak along the lines of encouragement. I sense with all my heart that there is a new challenge coming to the house, but it's also a time of transition, and it's a time of shifting, but it has been, and it's going to be a time of shaking. But in all this, there's also an, a time of an awakening that is expectant in the very near future. As we look at what life has been like for you, and I've had conversations with Pastor Len, and it's been the same for us, that all kinds of challenges were thrown at us in 2019. There was sickness in your house. There was sickness in our house. There was struggle. Yesterday, we laid to rest an amazing stalwart who's been part of the founding fiber of this house, our late brother Joe Miller. And the presence of God was so tangible because another cedar has fallen in Lebanon. There is a great celebration in heaven at his homecoming. We will grapple and we will struggle because we're human. But in all this, we grieve differently. We grieve with a hope. We grieve with an expectation that we will see our brother again. I always reflect on David when he prayed that God would preserve the child in Bathsheba's womb and the child dies. David's servants are amazed at how David gets up. Instead of going into mourning, he washes his face. He puts oil on his face. And one of his servants approach him and ask. David, how come you are not mourning now that the child has died? And David makes a profound statement. He says, I, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. The only way we can see our brother Joe again is if we stay faithful to the cross, if we look unto the author and the finisher of our faith, if we believe that he who has begun a good work will finish the work, then we shall see him one day at the great place of worship with our Lord. I believe the Lord is saying this morning, the foundation 
of this house is now completed. It's been built over 30 years. And God is saying it's now time to start building the skyscraper jubilee. No longer will you look to rebuild foundations. They have been laid. It's time that you begin to build on what God has already started. Isn't it a privilege to be in the earth in this season in this house? Come on, church. And I believe God has enabled, he's saying to you, I have enabled you to triumph over adversity. And now build like Nehemiah with the building trowel in one hand and draw your sword from its sheath in the other hand. The Lord has carried you on eagle's wings. Some of you don't know how you made it to this point. Some of you don't know how you still remain connected to God in this season. Because during your struggle, you may have thought, is it worth it after all? Is God still in the business of preserving me? How come, God, you are allowing all these things to happen to me? We read of what God did for Israel in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 to 5. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. And how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And now, this is the word of the Lord to you as a, as a, as a congregation. And now, if you obey me fully, if you obey me fully, God is not into half measures. God doesn't want a fraction of you, a portion of you. God is a jealous God. He wants your heart, your soul, your mind, and your spirit. He wants your bank balance. He wants your dreams. He wants every ounce of energy that, he ha- that you have in you. He wants every gift, every talent, and every ounce of energy, and every ounce of education that you have. He wants all of you. And if you would obey Him fully, God wants us to hold him to his word. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1.5, he watches over his word to perform his word. The Bible says God honors his word above his name. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall never pass away. The word of God says, Job says, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. God watches over his word. And so he's saying to you, if you obey me fully, hallelujah, And keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be treasured. You'll be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. There are places in the scripture, child of God, where there are many hardships that God's people experience. And this morning I want you to go on a journey with me. We're going to go into the Bible and draw lessons of growth and encouragement from these experiences. They are experiences of adversity, of struggle, of challenge, of mistakes and shortcomings in abundance in the Scriptures. But I can safely say, and I know I speak on behalf of all of us, none of us can say we are without sin. Because if God himself were to count sins, which one of us would be able to stand? None of us, as long as we are in this body, can say that we all have it together every time, all the time. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But yet God chooses to work through us. We weak and feeble vessels. It's the same God who chooses to work with us. I love this God. He can work through anybody, but he chooses you and he chooses me. The thing I love about him, he's always willing to use anybody who will say, Yada my Lord, send me. Yada my God, begin to start a new thing in me. I'm no longer longer settling for the average. I'm no longer settling for mediocrity. But I believe the word that came at the leadership council, you've been an amazing family. But God says he's transitioning you into becoming a mighty army. He's calling you to become warriors. Hallelujah. The goal of scripture is multifaceted. But when it comes to adversity, God is saying, embrace it. God is saying, be a good soldier and endure hardship. God is saying, 
take it on the chin. God is saying, use it because he intends uh, to prepare you to press in and to press forward into your destiny. There's nothing that's come upon you that God's not going to use to sharpen you and to shape you and to prepare you for the calling. There's a, it's a high calling, man. He has put a high calling on you. Are you willing to embrace the high calling that God has put upon your life? The thing I love about God, there are no poor cousins. There are no distant relatives. There are only sons in the kingdom. There are daughters. There are sons and daughters in the kingdom. God is a God of equality. Are you willing? Only the hungry, only the hungry. I like what Jason said. He's challenging you to be more hungry. Only the hungry meet God. And when God meets a hungry person, you become a powerful agent of change. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. So I don't care what the enemy has thrown on you. I want you to know that God will not allow the enemy to overtake you. I risk. Like Job in the word of God. Job had a confidence in God. I love how he embraces the hard times. And in Job chapter 42, verse 1 and 2, this is what Job says when he's engaging with God. He says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. No purpose of yours can be taught. You know, when I became a believer some 30 years ago, I was told, be like a cork. Your, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. You don't have to manipulate, plot, scheme, and connive. If you have an anointing on you, God will open the door. If others are trying to shut the door, God will raise you up. The Bible says uh, in Revelation 3, 8, Behold, I set before you an open door that no one can shut. It doesn't matter what the opinions of others are about you. If God has called you, he will raise you up. If God has called you, he will anoint you. If God has called you, he'll give you the openings. Trust him. Hallelujah. We're not going to allow the hurts of last year, the failures of yesteryear, the weaknesses, the grappling, the poisonous arrows of the enemy. We're not going to allow them to steamroll us. We're not going to allow the enemy to stunt us or to stall us, let alone sink us. I believe it's a new season in the house. I believe it's the word. We're taking the prophetic word spoken at the leadership council, spoken at strong last year and we are mixing that word with faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, they did not enjoy the benefits of the word because it was not mixed with faith. I believe God is saying uh, without faith uh, it is impossible to please him. You need to take the word, the word spoken to you, the word in your spirit and you need to believe that God is going to make that word realize. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo! I believe the Lord is saying to you right now, it's time to respond and not react. I know there have been difficulties with money, with marriage, with friendship, with community, with calling, with immediate and extended church family. I know some of you may say, it's better to look elsewhere. When God calls you to a house, he plants you there. The relationship is never on the table. It's about dealing with adversity. It's dealing with challenge. It's embracing it like a soldier. If you want to be in the army of God, you got to move into being a warrior. You cannot just be a worshiper, you got to be a warrior too. And there's a calling now. Come on, church. I was speaking to one of the young men yesterday. He said, you can't find this kind of worship anywhere in Pensacola. I said, but God is taking us beyond being a worshiper. We need to be a warrior. Hallelujah. Are there warriors in the house? For you to be that warrior, you don't got to embrace adversity. When I became a believer many years ago, I remember taking Hebrews chapter 6 and looking at the six core fundamentals. People are talking about, yes, uh, faith towards God, baptisms, uh, and yes, the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. But everybody was talking about baptism in the Holy Ghost, baptism in water, but nobody was talking about the baptism of suffering. We live in a dispensation where the prosperity gospel has watered down the true meaning of the gospel. 
Where if you're going through a hardship, God's not with you. Who told you that? If you're going through a struggle and things are not working out according to your time frame and your timeline, who told you God is not with you? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. My God, our God is with you. Hallelujah. No matter what the difficulties may be. In James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, I'm so challenged by this word. And I believe it's a word for the house. Because with all the struggles you've been through, God saying to you today, consider it pure joy. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I believe the church has become so caught up in counseling after counseling and more counseling, yet the Word of God is our counselor, the Holy Spirit is our counselor, and as a result of that, we end up spending more time on maintenance mode. But there's a city out here called Pensacola. There's a city out here that needs the gospel. There's a city over here that needs you. You are Jesus' hands. You are Jesus' feet. And we are collectively the army of God. Let's get out into the field and let's take up our positions and take a hold of the promise. Hallelujah. The Lord is saying today, oh man, when I look at you through the eyes of faith, I see an amazing army, the best kept secret in Pensacola. When I look at you and I see the amazing fivefold ministry operating in this house, I see the prophetic so powerful here. You only know how people in other places long for what you have. I see the anointing in this place where people are responding but, and weeping here, yeah, but it ends here. Yeah. God is saying, what's that anointing for? You want to feel good? Feel good days are over. The Lord says, rise up. He says, come on, take what you have. And I want to go through a few portions of Scripture just reminding us that whatever adversity comes, God has your back. The Bible says that many had, had difficulties in the Scripture. Some, bad decision making. Others, reacting out of anger rather than responding. Others became carnal and fleshly. And as a result of that, they process everything with the mind. You are a spiritual church. Begin to see who you are. You are a spiritual church. Begin to realize that you're empowered by God. You are a spiritual church. Therefore, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You're a church that has the anointing operating in you. It's time that you stand up and be counted. It's time that you pursue the purpose which God has placed upon your heart. I see a few places in Scripture where people struggled and bad decisions led to dreadful circumstances. I look at Eve. She yielded to temptation. The enemy tested her quest for power to be like God, and she yielded to the temptation. Satan misconstrued the truth and led her astray. There are many in a household who are, are, are being led astray because Satan misconstrues the truth. It's time you listen to the word and you listen to the voice of God, not to the opinions of others. I really believe we must be careful because God is saying that no temptation that has overtaken you, which is common to man, God is faithful and he will provide a way of escape. So when Eve messed up, the whole of the human race stumbled into sin. But I want you to know there is a bomb in Gilead. I want you to know that there is restoration in God. I want you to know there is a Jesus that came and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. So whatever your circumstances are and how bad you've gone wrong, I want you to know today that the Lord is saying, I have come to restore that which a canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm is eaten. I think of Isu. I think about my own life when I look at Isu. His impatience, his inability to control his appetites, his hunger and lust for immediate satisfaction. Fulfillment led him to sell his birthright and blessing for a pot of soup. You know, the church doesn't talk about lust. It's one of the greatest challenges facing the church. There's a book called Every Man's Battle, and I agree with the title. Every man has his battle. But let me tell you, not only men, women too. 
And the Bible's calling us, every one of us, to yield to God so that he can deal with us. You know, when you don't have just dealt with what happens to you, you look around instead of looking up. There's a distraction. Instead of focusing on God, you're focusing on who's the next person that you could get a hold of. If you have lust in your heart, you cannot ship it. You cannot even father. Because if you touch a lady, she'll feel that spirit transfer onto her. God is saying, which of us are struggling in this area? You are beginning with your 40-day fast. It's a crucial time. I remember struggling, not having anybody to talk to because we are a very conservative society. How can you say you're born again? How can you say you're a man of God? How can you say you are a child of the Lord and you're struggling in this area? You'd be looked down upon. As I waited upon God, I knew the power of fasting that can dry up lust. It can conquer the stronghold of lust. I really believe more people will become centered on God when they have victory in this area. I want you to know whenever a person has lust, they do not function at their optimum. They're not operating their calling. They cannot hear God clearly because it's a driving force of the enemy. Isu gave up what was supposed to be his. But I thank God that the cross came. I thank God that no power is greater than the power of the cross. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God and salvation. I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how long you've been addicted. I want you to know when the power of God comes into a place, he breaks the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. You can be free immediately. Why? Because God has an army in this place. He's moving you into an army. That's the word of the Lord to you. I think of Moses. How instead of responding, he reacted out of frustration, the murmuring, the complaining. Uh, the people were never, ever fulfilled. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 48, On that same day, the Lord told Moses, go up to the Amirab range to Mount Nebo in Moab, across to Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I'm giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people. Just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hur, was gathered to his people. This is because of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Mary Kadesh. God is a God of a second chance. I'm glad he's not an Old Testament God. That is a New Testament God. I, I thank God that it's grace and truth and in that order. It's not only grace where you can do as you please. It's not only truth for legalism. It's grace and truth. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and full of truth. Hallelujah. It's grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. He can set you free completely. Hallelujah. Samson. Samson was an amazing man. The Nazarite vow. He lifted up the gates of Gaza. Samson slew a thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey. The anointing was on this man in such power and authority. But he gave in to the lust of the flesh. And he saw the beautiful woman Delilah. And as a result of that, he gave away his secret. But I want you to know in Samson's death, he killed more people than in his life. But I want you to know there's a greater than Samson that's come. He's Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus is here today. I don't care how bad it's gone for you. I don't care how bad it's gone for you. I know the power of the blood of Christ. It cleanses our sins. I know the power of the anointing can enable any man, any man and any woman, no matter where you are, when God comes upon you, you become a new man. You are changed instantly. You are transformed to fulfill the calling of God. Woo! Come on, man. What about Judas? Judas had the whole treasury in his hands, but he gave in and he took that which was so precious, the Son of God, and traded him for 30 pieces of silver. But I want you to know, not even Judas could hold him down. All that was happening was destined for God. It was destined for the cross. It was destined for our healing. It was destined for our salvation. What about Demas? Demas is known as a man who forsook the, uh, the, the, the whole concept of working with an apostolic company in Paul because he loved the world. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. 
Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. I really believe the pull of the world, the pull of the enemy, and the lust of the flesh would rob us sometimes of what God has in store. But I want you to know that God will give you a love for him that is amazing. God will make you a God chaser. He'll make you a longing for him. There is a need for the presence of God, and that comes if we pursue God. There, there is a challenge that's gone out this morning. Won't you become hungry? Won't you become desperate for God? Won't you begin to intentionally say, I want more of you, God. I long for more of you, God. There is a longing in my heart to meet with you. If you don't meet with him, life would be average. I'm not settling for the average anymore. And I believe there's a same for you. Jubilee is not an average church. You have the power of God that is waiting for this world right around you. Ananias and Sapphira, all they could have done was say, we did not give all the money. It was their choice to give, but they chose to hold back the truth. You see, God loves truth. Jesus is truth. In the context of the, of the Greek, truth is a body of knowledge. But in the context of the Hebrew, truth is a person. God is looking to us to embrace Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. God is calling for us uh, to rise up as an army, and I'm building on the word that was coming over the past few days. And the word was God is raising up an army because he's raising up among you an apostle. An apostle who's standing on the ship, the apostolos, and he's saying, where is the army? Let's go out into the place of around us and begin to conquer territory. Let's go and take what's rightfully ours in the marketplace, in the communities, in the surrounding communities. God is calling you this day. But you may say, Pastor Greg, all those examples you used were people who chose to do wrong. But I want you to know there are people among us who did not do any evil but suffered the same pain. The Bible speaks in Job, and it's so clear. Job chapter 2 verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none on the earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity through you incite me against him to ruin him without reason. In verse 6, Job chapter 2, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your presence. He's in your hand, sorry, but you must spare his life. Verse 7, so Satan went out from the presence of God and afflicted Job with painful sores. From soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Verse 10, he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he had said. The Bible says that God honored Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Job said, though my body shall be destroyed by the worms, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job believed that even when trouble came, when struggle came, when difficulty came, he had to be centered on Christ. I believe all the stuff that's thrown your way has just been sharpening you to be that army that God has intended for you to be. The foundation has been laid. It's time to build a skyscraper. I really believe that all that's in you is enough to take the city. Say, Greg, you're a wishful thinker. I believe with one person, we are in the majority. I believe that God can change your heart of the king. He can change a nation in a day. I believe that's the kind of God that I serve. He can do anything. In Job chapter 42 verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. 
Amen. Whatever the, the, the enemy has taken away from you, whatever the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and the locust has eaten, I believe this is the day that God is saying it's time you believe. I have restored everything that was taken away from you. I really believe you lost people in this house. Watch God begin to accelerate the incoming of a new generation. A generation that will get your DNA. A generation that will believe this is the house of God. A generation that will not look over the fence. Stop looking over the fence. You're in the right place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I really believe the Lord is saying to you today, and he says to me too, take note of my word. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus had died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. It is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in the whole of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. Christ Jesus. I believe the Lord is raising up a Caleb spirit among you. Not those that will take note of all the problems, but those who will begin to see the promise. I believe there's a Caleb generation rising up among you. Not those who would simply be constantly looking for the flaws, the weaknesses, and the struggles of the house. I believe there's a Caleb generation rising up among you. They will not be swayed by the multitudes. They stand alone and they hear God. And when they hear God, they set their face like flint. I believe there's a Caleb generation among you who are saying, God, I'm going to use 40 years of complaining, moaning, and gruesome people, and I'm going to take my mountain. God is saying, are you ready to take your mountain? Can you be like Caleb? He was 85 years old. When he was 85, 85 years old. He said, give me this mountain. Uncle Bob, you're 86 years old this year. Say to God, God, give me this mountain. It's my mountain. It's time to take your mountain. Are you going to take your mountain, the mountain of media? Are you going to take the mountain, the mountain of the workplace? Are you going to take the mountain, the mountain of the arts? Are you going to take the mountain, the mountain of the family? It's time to take your mountain. I believe there's a whole new generation rising up among you. They will not only receive the promise, they'll enter the promise. Only Joshua and Caleb, who are of a different spirit, enter the promise. I heard the promises, yeah. There are many promises that have came, here. Yeah. I've come here for stronger conferences. I've heard promises, yeah. I've heard prophetic words like never any place on the earth. And I believe it's time you take your mountain. It's time you take your mountain. Hallelujah. But it's not only those with a Caleb spirit, there's those with a David anointing. They will take the lion and the bear, they will not complain, because when Goliath comes, they will be ready. Stop complaining about the lion and the bear. You've conquered them, now it's time you take your Goliath. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40 onwards, then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He took David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come yeah, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I 
come against you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. The rest is history. My imagination runs wild when I think about this. This little boy running to the battlefront with such aggression because he knew he was not in his own power. He was not in his own ability. He was operating as a servant of the Lord. He knew that God would direct that stone and that stone would hit the bull's eye, the center of the forehead of a giant. A massive giant fell flat before David. He cut his head off with his own sword. I believe there's a David generation here among you who are not going to complain about the Goliaths, but you're going to face them. It's time that the army rises up in this house. I've been here many times. I know what you have. I sense what you're carrying. It's time that you take out your stone and you put it in your sling. It's time that you begin to swing your sling and run towards the enemy. Pensacola is looking for a David to kill the giant of materialism. You need to kill the giant, the giant of agnosticism. You need to kill the giant of new age. You need to kill the giant of all kinds of things prevalent. The giant of divorce. The giant of abortion. The giant of all kinds of things. There's a David in this place. Can I hear an amen? Can I see there's a David in this place? There's a David in this place. God is waiting for you. But I also see those with the spirit of John who are connected to Jesus. That Jesus on the cross could say, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And from that day onwards, Mary went to live with John. It's the same John who had the deeper experiences than the others. He went into the garden of Gethsemane and he saw the sweat droplets on Jesus' face, black blood. It was the same John who was there at the cross when Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Laba Sabbathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the same John that was there in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus went up and as they looked up to heaven, the angel said, why gaze ye in this manner? The same Jesus who's gone up will come back in the like manner. It was the same John who stood next to Peter in Acts chapter 2 when Peter stood up with the 11 and began to preach a gospel and 3,000 souls came to heaven. It's the same John who went to the Isle of Patmos and wrote the great revelations that we know one day he will not come anymore on a donkey. He'll come with a drawn sword. He'll come as a stallion. We, we know the John who writes that one day the whole world will see him when the dead in Christ shall rise first and we that are on the earth shall be caught up and so shall we ever be with God. It's the same John who says, all those in the grave shall hear his voice and they will come forth. Those born died in sin to eternal judgment. Those that died in Christ will be resurrected to eternal life. Come Come on, church. There's an army here. Yeah. There's an army here. Yeah. It's an army here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Can you feel the presence of God? Can the worship team please come? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes so profoundly that I'll be failing you if I don't share this verse of scripture with you. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. When we become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. If the apostle that had an encounter in Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus road, if the same man who wrote more than a third of the New Testament, if the same man who planted more than 20 churches, the same man who had an encounter with God, whether in the, in the flesh or in the spirit, we do not know. Is the same man who knows how to endure suffering and how to embrace adversity, shouldn't you and I do the same? Shouldn't you and I say jubilee, we are taking, and you know what, if you, when you flow in God, the persecution will increase. You won't be liked by the city. You want to be loved by people? You will not be able to fulfill the mandate of God. 
I want to die empty. I want to die empty. I want to die having poured myself out. I always said to my wife, one day I'll die at the pulpit if it needs be. But when I preach, I'm going to preach as though it's my last sermon. Whether it's five or five thousand or fifty thousand. I'm going to give the same passion. I'm going to give the same intensity because I believe that the God who saved me is the God who's willing to save anybody. He can take you from a dunghill and He can make you a prince. He can take you from a place of addiction and He can set you free. He can take you when you doubted yourself and make you confident that you won't forget who made you confident. My God is here today. And I believe this couple, this set couple of this house, they want to take this city and that set couple that joined them, they want to take this city. It's not in the majority. Do you have God with you? Yes, you do. Is that anointing that flowed in Acts chapter 2 in this place? Yes, it is. It's the same cross that saved the early church, the same cross that saves us today. Yes, it does. God got no favorites. But He's looking for willing people. Are you willing to say, Lord, Jeremiah sent me. Are you willing to say, God, if I've got to leave Pensacola and I've got to go to another city to plant another jubilee, I'm willing to go. Because the call of God is so clear on your life. If God says it's time for you to sacrifice so you can have an encounter with a missionary trip, not first out of the city, first in the city, then out of the city, you say, yes, sir. You say, yes, ma'am. Are you willing to die empty? You know that Jacob has the privilege of calling all his sons around him. And his closing remarks are prophetic words on each of his sons. I've been shepherding for 32 years. It's a long time. And in that time, I've seen many people die. And I've seen some who die full who are trying to do on their dying bed what they should have done when they were healthy. I've seen men try to reconcile in their last moments because they left it too late. Now is the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, it's now, not tomorrow. The application of what came out of the leadership council is tomorrow. Now. God says, rise up. Now. Pull your sword out of your sheath. Now. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Now. Begin to heed the call of God. If He knows the number of hairs in our head, if He knows your uprising and your down sitting, He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knows you, He knows you by name. Isaiah 43 verse 1, Behold, thou art mine, I know you by name. He knows the number of days you have spent on the earth. Now is the day. Now is the time. There's no moment like the now. Redeem the time. Maximize the time. I would to God, not only you, but all of us, myself included, would be able to say these words of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Can the entire worship team please come? 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And I love this part. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. What do you have in your hand? Brazil is waiting for you. What do you have in your hand? He will, he will take it and multiply it. What do you have? New England is waiting for you. Beyond New England, every corner of the earth, the press center will go. What do you have in your hand? It's taking longer than you anticipated. But God, but God, but God, if He can change a nation in a day, He can accelerate anything. My brother Doug, you have the word of the Lord to you. God is going to multiply what He's intended for you. 
Begin to embrace that word and run with that word. You want to go to corners of the earth where you can pour your life into people? God is saying now is the time. God gave you the break because you have a call for those young people. Mold them, shape them, put your life into them, invest in them. I don't know what it is, but I know it's a beautiful thing to be on the earth in this season. And I know one thing, God got no favorites. Can you hear the clarion call? Can you hear the voice of God? John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I give unto them eternal life. Can you hear his voice? Are you waiting for the opinions of others to endorse your calling? Who is the bishop and shepherd of our souls? Who is the one that saves a human being? It's God. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost. Stand with me if you're ready to join these two couples in taking Pensacola. Stand with me if you know for too long you've been gathering dust. Your sword is stuck in its sheath. Draw it out and sharpen it. I see the word of the Lord in you. If you want to respond, the altar is open. There's something about getting out of your seat and saying, count me in. I don't want to just be a lip service anymore. Count me in. This church cannot go anywhere with the pulpiteers. The army is everybody, not only the commanders. The Lord is calling you. I feel God saying to you, from this day forward, you know when Samuel, when he went to Jesse's house, he looked at all the sons and he thought the king was among them, but he wasn't. And he said, is there still another? Yes, he's out in the field. He's looking after the sheep. Paraphrasing. I will not sit down until he comes. When David came in, the Bible says he was handsome, ruddy, of fine features. Samuel took the oil and anointed him. The Bible says from that day forward, the anointing rested upon David. I feel the anointing in this place. Can we have a worship chorus? Can you speak to the Lord? Can I hear you talk to the Lord? Lord, Lord, I'm available. Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired, oh Lord, oh God, of being on, on the periphery. I'm tired, oh God, of complaining. I'm tired, oh God, of looking and blaming others for my circumstance, for my trouble, for my difficulties, for my struggle. Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired, God. I am available. Where are you working, Lord? I'm going to see a victory for the battle lost to you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. I'm gonna see a victory. Come on, worship. Me. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle up today's message was not just a message to receive it was a message to respond it's a prophetic call for where God is taking us this is a year for us of conquest it's a year to face the battle it's a year we've been speaking in from this identity of Joshua and today you heard this message that came out like a trumpet that was calling us to be who God is calling us to be. Now in James chapter 1, it tells us in verse 27 to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Or you end up self-deceived, the Bible says. It said because if somebody is a hearer but doesn't do it, it's like looking in the mirror 
and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. God is reminding you who you look like. There's two things. It's very simple. There's two things. God showed me what is my function, and then I have to do the function. Those are the two things. Show me what is my function, and then I have to do the function. And so I want you to just raise both of your hands high and just say, Lord, anoint me for the purpose of your army. Turn us from a family into an army that we could conquer in this season. Now tell him, show me my function and strengthen me to do the function. Say it again. Show me my function and strengthen me to do the function. Come on, say it again. Show me my function and strengthen me to do the function in the name of Jesus. Now reach over. Reach over. Put your hand on the shoulder of somebody next to you. Come on. You're touching destiny. You're touching into the army when you're touching somebody's shoulder. Just begin to pray for them right now. Just begin to pray strength over their life. Just begin to pray for God to awaken their identity, to give clarity to their function, to give clarity to their purpose, to give clarity. You might not know what you're going to do six months from now, but you need to know what you're supposed to do today. You might not know what you're going to do next year, but you need to know what you're doing this year. And God, through what I'm doing in this function, God, you're going to show me the next. Lord, let me be the army that you called me to be. Let us capture the momentum of the moment, God. Lord, to rise up, to be, Lord, the leaders, the workers, the servers, the businessmen, the people involved in education on every area of the world that we work in, God. Let us sow, God, from this place into other places, God. Let us build this place as a model. Then we can reproduce the model. Lord, I thank you today, God, for what you're doing in us, God. And we pray strength in Jesus' name. Come on, just give the Lord an offering of your praise right now. Come on, go ahead. Come on, lift your voice. I'm going to see your victory. You mean it? Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. So your mission is not just in these walls, but your mission is through those doors. It just isn't a place you serve on Sunday and it's good to serve on Sunday. But it's a place that you have to reach out beyond this. Be who you are, be the army, enter into the enemy's territory, capture what the enemy holds, which is always people and souls, amen. And let's see God do something amazing and transformative with the lives that he's bringing to us. Do you believe that today? Oh, we got a lot of good Sundays ahead. Listen, we got a lot of good days ahead because we're going somewhere. God bless you. Thank you for being at Jubilee today. Now go do what you've heard so God can bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being at Jubilee. Turn it.